So, when I was 11, I lived in Comiso, Sicily. My mother was in the military at the time, she was in the Air Force. This, in itself, was one of the most beautiful places I've ever lived in my entire life. I remember walking through the streets and plazas and falling in love with this place. Sometimes with the people, other times with the architecture. But when I was 12, things changed a little bit for me. <laughs> my mother got stationed in New Jersey. But my whole family's from New Jersey, so it was good. We got a chance to go back, and, and we ended up moving in with my grandmother for a little while. Now, I don't know if you've ever been to Trenton, New Jersey, but I was not in love with the architecture in this place. <laughs> so we moved in with my grandmother, and, and there was something there that, that I used to, to be afraid of, and it was called the abyss. Now, just to give you a little context, the abyss was, um, my, my grandmother's house was about a 15-foot-wide by 70-foot-wide house, that beautiful little row house, actually kind of, it was in a hood, so, you know. Um, <laughs> so the abyss, in the middle of this house was a staircase. The staircase was, it was daunting, and it was, it was cold and dark, and my grandmother used to walk up and down these stairs, and her legs, her legs would hurt every time she walked up and down. And I remember thinking to myself at the time, my grandmother shouldn't live in a place where the architecture hurts her body, right? So living in that place, though, my family and my friends were there. So it was home. It was soul food for me. And I got a chance to understand that. So the dissonance, though, between place and space, between Sicily and Comiso, it instantly triggered something for me. I started to understand what, the, what disadvantage and disparity looked like. This is also the moment that I decided to become an architect. In that moment, I didn't really know what architecture meant, so my family kind of egged me along and, and helped me get to where I wanted to be. But, but as I moved on in my career, I focused on architecture and design justice advocacy. So what is design justice, right? Well, design justice recognizes that race and culture and architecture are inherently connected. It also acknowledges that we want to dismantle the privilege and power structures that actively use architecture to create systems of injustice within the built environment. It allows us and, and tells us that we, we know that architecture has a role to play. Architecture has a role to play in creating racial and cultural equity in space. And this isn't new. This isn't new at all. Whitney M. Young, who was the, yeah, you like that? Uh, <laughs> that was for you. Uh, um, Whitney M. Young, who was the director of the National Urban League, actually said back in 1968, he said, your profession, uh, he actually referred to our profession, at our contributions towards the, the cause of civil rights as both thunderously silent and completely irrelevant. Damn. Right? And he was right, he was right. We have perfected a process of design that creates fantastic environments for those with means and wealth, but have turned a neglectful eye towards those without it. And there's equality in this whole thing, right? So as architects, we want equality for all. But the problem with that is that our silence when it comes to issues of injustice in the built environment is complicity. And <laughs> And for us, we need to understand that equality is not equity. In reality, architecture is a documentarian of inequality and injustice. And the language we use to talk about place and space reveals our values and tells our biases. There's a fantastic quote by Ken Kerr that kind of perfectly sums this whole idea up for me, and it reads, the first American house built in wartime Java completely bewildered the natives there, right? And instead of building walls out of local bamboo that was closely spaced together to, to keep out the rain and let in the light and air, the Americans cut holes in the walls to create windows, to let in the light and air, right? And then they put panes in those windows to let in the light but block out the air. And then they put in blinds and curtains to block out the light, too. Um, so this, this quote, it perfectly exemplifies what happens when you bend over backwards to ignore culture and race 
in architecture. And in fact, the dialogue between culture and place has existed throughout architecture's history. In fact, the term story referring to the levels of a building actually is just simply a contraction of the word history. And it's derived, it's said to be derived from the narrative carvings above Greek and Roman buildings, right, on the frieze and the windows. So from African hieroglyphs of Nubia and Egypt to the decorative carvings of Greece and Rome, to the Indinkra ironwork found right here in New Orleans, we have almost always embedded the story of life and society into our buildings. I'm going to tell you one, let me build you one last story. I had a professor of mine in grad school that spent some time in Alabama during the 1960s, and he told me this little story. He told me that he wanted to go down and do some research on how people kind of move through space. He was doing ethnographic studies which is really the study of people and culture through in place and space. He was doing this at the height of Jim Crow, with 250 years of slavery as prologue. And during his studies, he, he, he came across something really, really interesting. And he told me that it divided itself along neighborhood and racial lines. And so what did he do? He went out to the neighborhood. He looked at the tendencies and frequencies of, of people moving through place and space. And what he realized was that the overwhelming majority of white families in this area went through the front door of their house. Now, that in itself is not really all that surprising or interesting. But when you pair that with the fact that the overwhelming majority of black families went through the side or rear door of their house, something became a little bit more interesting. And so, that question, he started to, oh, sorry, let me get that. So the, he didn't really understand the reason for this phenomenon, right? And for me, as a young black man who spent almost all my time going through the side or rear door of my grandmother's house, I did understand it. I understood that the residue of slavery and Jim Crow left a well-worn pattern on the lives and souls of black folk and has almost always been translated through generations. You see, when oppression and injustice are institutionalized and then manifested in our architecture, people have to change their patterns. They change their rhythms. It effectively changes the way we, uh, the cultural meaning and the relationship with space. See, there is power. There is power in architecture. And architecture has the power to speak the language of the people we serve. We just have to be willing to speak to the people without power. Because in the end, language is important. And architecture is a language. And architecture, like all languages, allows us to tell a story. Because stories are important. And buildings tell our stories. And diverse stories are the result of diverse cultures. Because culture is important. And culture is the consequence of persistent circumstances and immediate conditions. And for people of color in America, there is power in the places and spaces where our culture is recognized, where our stories are told, where our language is valued. Because that is not only good design, that is justice. Thank you.